Text messages like these are some of the only ways Ukrainians separated by war can connect right now when real hugs and smiles are impossible. They're between Western Michigan University student Anna Maria Astor and her grandma, who is still in Ukraine right now. Anna Maria says, good morning, how are you? And grandma says, alive, no more energy to be scared, pray for us. They do have bombings happening all over Kiev all the time. My dad is still working there as a doctor. Dad spares a moment to text his daughter. Everything will be okay. Mom texts her, I love you very much. Anna Maria Astor's family was one of millions stuck in traffic soon after the first Russian attack started five weeks ago. Her mom shares these pictures of Anna Maria's little sister hiding for safety in a basement, packing up luggage and sleeping in the car trying to escape the war. Dad had to stay behind. Men under 60 were banned from leaving Ukraine to join in the fight. I know that he left his car back when at the border when he was dropping off uh, my mom and my sisters. So he traveled by train because it wasn't safe to travel by car back here because of all the military operations. Meanwhile, another WMU student, Maria Parkomenko's hometown of Melitopol, is now taken over by Russian forces. I was very shocked and I didn't expect that it would happen because a lot of experts uh, said that it would not happen. My whole life changed. And and my mindset changed, and I think my life will never be the same after this war. Maria says her family is trying to keep a low profile and avoid confrontation with the Russian soldiers occupying her hometown right now. They have problems with sleep. My mom said they go to bed very late, and they're always careful because they try to listen what goes on uh, outside. Uh, they live close to the military base. There is a terrible food deficit in the city, medicine deficit. Bombings like these keep her family in hiding. How do you feel when you see all of the devastation that's going on? Mm -hmm. I feel uh, so much pain in my heart and uh, sometimes I even cry when I see it because it makes me uh, feel so terrible. I, I really don't understand uh, the point of this war. It, it doesn't make sense. And I think just Russia is the most evil country in, in this world, what they're doing to my people. Their families fighting for their country and their lives while they watch in anguish from afar. I know that he's still frustrated and scared as any person would be, and it's normal. I know that he's brave and he's willing to help everyone, but I can't even imagine how hard it can be. Anna Maria says her mom and sister have finally made it safely to the U.S., staying with family friends in Seattle right now. They had already gotten tourist visas, planning to visit Anna Maria during her stay here in the U.S. way before the war started. She says they are lucky. Anna Maria's dad tells her the number of casualties and injuries at the hospital he works at in Kiev grows by the day. For now, the texts continue, and both women hope for a quick end to this war. Attorneys for the defendants in the trial for plotting to kidnap and kill Governor Gretchen Whitmer are now resting their case in federal court. But not before a heated exchange on the stand today from the only suspect to take the witness stand in his own defense. Daniel Harris echoed the defense we've heard all throughout this trial. There were no serious plans. It was all talk. He says the group was more interested in drinking and hanging out than actually kidnapping Governor Whitmer. Soon Soon, it'll be up to the jury to decide whether they buy that argument. News Channel 3's Mike Kravcik joins us live outside federal court in Grand Rapids. Today, now day 14 of this federal trial. News Channel 3 has been there since the very beginning. Mike Kravcik leading our continuing coverage of this case. He's live now to tell us how the suspect is taking aim at the informant the FBI says helped crack this case. Mike. Yeah, all throughout this trial, attorneys and now one suspect is arguing that they were entrapped by FBI agents and informants on the case. Suspect Daniel Harris calling FBI informant Big Dan the B word. But prosecutors say his words tell an entirely different story. A jailhouse recording played here in court today. Show Harris saying that he thought Adam Fox was the plot's ringleader, saying, quote, he's the reason why I'm here. 
On the witness stand, when asked by his attorney if he agreed to abduct Governor Whitmer, Daniel Harris repeatedly says absolutely not. The 24-year-old former Marine, one of four suspects charged in the kidnapping plot, he says he joined the Wolverine Watchmen to shoot guns and drink beer. Assistant U.S. Attorney Jonathan Roth asking Harris why he never left the group when they started to talk about kidnapping the governor. He mentions Big Dan, later tapped as an FBI informant after reporting the group's talk of killing police officers. Harris calls Dan the B-word. Roth asks, why is that? Harris says, quote, he gets scared by memes and words. You went to Iraq and came out, and that was scary for you? You're a Was it a good idea for your client to call informant Dan at the witness stand? I have no comment. Thank you, you so much. Weather? Defense attorneys resting their case after a day and a half and earlier than expected. A judge allowed about a half a dozen witnesses to exercise their Fifth Amendment rights to stay off the stand. And so will the remaining three suspects on trial. How come Adam won't testify? Um, Adam Fox uh, uh, exercised his right to remain silent. That's his right, and uh, he chose to do that. Defense attorneys now applaud the judge's ruling late today, allowing jurors to consider an entrapment defense. Attorneys had been arguing FBI agents and informants steered the four suspects on trial to the kidnapping plot. It's, it's a big win for us. I mean, it's something that had to happen, and, and uh, that's happened, so it's time to take advantage of that opportunity oh. tomorrow. But prosecutors argue they acted on their own. Ty Garbin and Caleb Franks, who took plea deals in exchange for testimony, say no feds steered them. Harris on the stand today calling both Franks and Garbin liars. And Harris calls Barry Croft, quote, a crazy stoner pirate. Bud admits under oath to building an explosive device containing pennies as shrapnel with Croft. Closing arguments will begin here tomorrow, and it's expected that the case will get to the jury by the afternoon. The men are charged with a potential life offense if convicted. When you get in that position of authority, you have to leave. We're not getting that from the city council. We're not getting that from uh, President Mays. Uh, he's not doing what he should do as way, by way of leading. We begin tonight with the behavior of Flint City Council. After months of new members being elected into council, steps are now being taken to provide disciplinary action against interruptions and a lack of decorum. This comes after some members were already censured for their behavior. Mid Michigan Hour reporter Alexis Ware has been speaking with the Flint Ethics and Accountability Board. Alexis, how do they plan to handle all these issues? Well, Dave, I'm told the Ethics and Accountability Board's main responsibility is to ensure the city charter is not violated, and I'm told they believe that has been done. The chairman of the board is now saying action will be taken against those who have violated the charter. There is a leadership gap uh, from our standpoint that that's why we're asking the question, that's why we're making recommendations, and that's why the board is going to act. Alan Gilbert is the chairman of the Flint Board of Ethics and Accountability. According to him, it's not a matter of if they're going to act on city council's behavior. It's a matter of when. I may have to, I may have to call a special meeting in the month of April so that, so that our investigation will keep legs under to keep moving. Gilbert tells me the Board of Ethics are working behind the scenes to prepare enough information to go forward with an investigation. According to Gilbert, the Board of Ethics and Accountability doesn't have the immediate authority to remove someone from their title or place on council, but they do make recommendations. Those recommendations ultimately circle back to council to consider and it's their choice to follow through on. I'm told if council ignores their recommendation, the next step is to to get the city attorneys and courts involved. The legal department will play a part. Uh, the city attorney's office we will have to inquire to them. This is our reason. This is what we want to do. And then if we win in court and they tell us that we have the right under this under the charter and under the law of the under the law of the municipality now, then we have subpoena power. Gilbert admits the board should have acted more quickly, but says they were still learning about their positions. I will admit that that we did not carry all of the responsibility and accountability that, that we should have, and because we were still learning. 
Now, Gibbard also spoke on the lack of trust some community members have when it comes to the ethics board and accountability, the ethics and accountability board, and specifically his preference of council members over others. Now, he says the decision on disciplining members is not up to him, but the entire board to decide on. He says he is acting in the best interest of his residents.